you're listening to sermon audio from Ankeny Free Church in Ankeny, Iowa, a community in Christ on a mission to reach our community for Christ. To learn more, head over to ankenyfree.church. Well, if you would, turn with me to Genesis 39. We're in this series called Overnight, and the reason it's called Overnight is because sometimes the Lord doesn't work just overnight. He has the long view in mind, and that's what we see with the life of Joseph. And here we're going to see that the Lord is with us even in the midst of suffering. Now, you, you may remember in the story of Joseph that we've, he's been sent off into slavery. Last week, we took a a break from that story to move over to talk about the, the story of Judah. And now we are shifting back and we are seeing what is happening with Joseph since he is in slavery. By way of reminder, the book of Genesis is divided into two sections. The first part is the four great events, creation, fall, flood, and then the Tower of Babel. Uh, the second part is the four great men, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and here these last 14 chapters, Joseph. So if you would here, now Joseph is going from, from slavery to convict, and we are seeing Joseph in this encounter with Potiphar and, well, it seems here with his wife, starting in verse 1. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house, over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he had left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he that he ate. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you. Because you are his wife, how then could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were there in the house, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household. And she said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. And she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as the master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, This is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph, showed him steadfast love, and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. 
And whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. And the keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Let us pray. Father, there are many here, I'm sure, that are walking in darkness that don't see any hope, feel powerless in their situation. And I pray that you would especially speak to those hearts right now. Lord, we came here to hear from you. And so, Lord, that we would ask that you would use my words and that you would work through me or in spite of me. But, Lord, that it would be your words that change our life and that you work by the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives. It is in the name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the account of Joseph here in Potiphar, or Potiphar's wife. Then we're going to look at the big story. And then we're going to look at our story, really the so what. What does this mean for us? And there'll be three things in that that we can take home with. So let's begin here at the beginning. Now, Joseph had been brought down to Egypt. So we remember that Joseph was purchased here from the Ishmaelites and that Joseph was a slave. In Egypt, they had slaves. They had slaves in the Roman Empire. Somewhere between 10 and 20% of the entire empire was enslaved populations, sometimes much higher concentrations. We've seen uh, slavery throughout the ages. We're all very well acquainted of the transatlantic slave trade, and not only that, the slave trade that occurred between Africa and the Middle East, those encompassing nearly 25 million peoples. We're aware of our own history, and I don't know how many of you are aware, but even today, there are over 28 million people that are in slavery and another 22 million that are in forced marriages. This is a problem from the beginning. And Joseph is in this state. We see that in the Bible there are different ways that this sort of uh, slavery is referred to. It can be anything from bonded work to forced labor to what we would consider chattel slavery, where a person is a possession just like you would own a chair. Christians throughout the years have often acted wickedly, but yet we see it's the triumph of Christian theology and Christian ideas that have undermined slavery globally. It's in the Bible that we find that people are created in God's image. All people. And then we look and we see in the New Testament where Paul skillfully undermines the pillars of slavery as he talks to Onesimus about his runaway, or talks to Philemon about his runaway slave, Onesimus. And then Paul speaking to Timothy rather directly in Timothy chapter 1 about how slave trading is this reprehensible sin. And so we've seen the work of God over the years. We know that it's not ended. And that is where Joseph is. And I remind you of that because his story is going to pick up. <laughs> but we need to remember the state that he is in. It does pick up. It says he becomes a successful man. He's given responsibility. The, the picture that's being painted here is one of a rather uh, pleasant stay, if it were, as you were. He has been moved into the house, probably out from the fields. And all of this, I mean, it could be because he's good looking. It could be because he's smart. It could be because he's strategic. Maybe he puts a great team around him. But the Bible says that the reason that he had all of this was, verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. And what Potiphar saw was that, verse 3, the Lord was with him. And it was the Lord that caused him to succeed. And because of that, Joseph was in charge of everything. Except, as it says here, verse 6, 
anything but the food he ate. It's probably an idiom referring to his most intimate matters. Potiphar dealt with his own intimate stuff, but Joseph was in charge of everything else. So it sounds like things are going well. And actually, it sounds like things are going well pretty well for Joseph. He is, here it says at the end of verse 6, he was handsome in form and appearance. Imagine that. Some of you are handsome in form and others in appearance, but Joseph was both. And his Potiphar's wife casts her eyes on Joseph and she says, lie with me. Now here, I think when I read some of the comments about Joseph, great emphasis is given to how Joseph resisted temptation, and he did. But I think our emphasis on that reflects more of our own soul and what we find tempting rather than maybe what Joseph necessarily found tempting. For example, we don't talk about, boy, you know, Judah just really overcame temptation and he didn't burn his daughter-in-law when she found out she was pregnant. You imagine that? Boy, I don't know what I would have done in that situation. Well, we don't talk like that, do we? And, and I think it's insightful here. If, if we really want to know what Joseph found important, he says it. He says, I, I'm not going to do this because, look, uh, responsibilities have been entrusted to me. You are a married woman. And this is evil in the sight of God. That's what motivated Joseph. That's what was in front of him. Instead, sometimes I think we more identify with Potiphar's wife. At any rate, she is persistent day after day, but his no is firm. There's one day when he's doing his work and she catches him by the garment. Now, we don't know actually what kind of woman this was. It may have been someone that was very attractive or she could have had... This big old maw just hooking in, trying to get him to go. And, but this time, he just runs away, sheds the outer garment, and flees. And her, her want of Joseph has become a need. And now this need has become something she's going to judge Joseph for. And the judgment hasn't worked, so now she's going to punish him. The man she desired... She's going to lie in order that he might be undone. And that's exactly what she does. We see that, that he runs away, and she begins to use some interesting language to describe him. Kind of throwing her husband under the bus, emphasizing that he was the one that brought him here. But also some interesting racial tones that this Hebrew, this Hebrew servant, now we know Egyptians later on at this time didn't eat with the Hebrews. That's what the Bible's going to tell us. And so she is now beginning to despise him, uh, dehumanizing this individual. Joseph is not left with much to say when she accuses him before Potiphar. His anger was kindled. We assume it Joseph, but it doesn't really say. Maybe he's seen this behavior before in his wife, and now he's losing a trusted servant because what's your, what are you going to do? It's interesting. Joseph doesn't rally a response that we have recorded here. And we don't know why Joseph isn't just executed outright. But nonetheless, he's put into prison. His descent has gone from the person in charge of everything to now incarceration. And yet, the Lord was still with Joseph. He was with him, verse 21, showed him steadfast love, gave him favor in the sight of the warden. And what Joseph experienced before Potiphar, he now experiences before the warden of this prison. He was entrusted with responsibility such that he didn't have to care for anything at all. And there we are. Now, once again, in the life of Joseph, if we were just to look at a chapter, we're maybe not given much direction on what this 
means for us. And so we have to look at the big story in order that, that we can understand some things that would be helpful for us. Maybe as we went through this, you're like, this story sounds familiar, and it should. It's a lot like Genesis chapter 37. In Genesis chapter 37, you had Joseph, he was sitting pretty good, having these dreams, and these stalks, and these sheaves bowing down. He has this special robe. And then suddenly, because of his righteous comments, which probably weren't well received, he is now suddenly sideways with, with people that he is working with. They take off his robe. They tell lies about him. And his descent goes down, down, down. In 37, to the pit and to slavery. In 39, from slavery to incarceration. The trajectory of Joseph. So it doesn't seem like it can get much lower. But one thing is interesting about this passage, which gives us hope, and that is the use of the name the Lord, the covenant name of God, Yahweh, I am which I am, a statement of his own self-existence, but also a statement used in the book of Exodus that he is with us. And we see that this covenant name of God is used six times in this passage, which is interesting because in the entire 14 chapters of the account of Joseph, it's only used three other times, two of which were last week. The Lord killed Ur, the Lord killed Onan. It's going to be used one more time in chapter 49. But other than that, all the occurrences are are here. And what it says about the Lord is revealing. The Lord was with Joseph. You see, this was the problem from the very beginning. Adam and Eve were created to be with the Lord, enjoying his presence in the garden. But because they wanted to be like God apart from God, that relationship was broken. And the story of Genesis, and really the story of the entire Bible, is a loving God repairing that relationship. The promise to Abraham, the statement to Isaac, the Lord is with you, the statement to Jacob, the Lord is with you, and here, multiple times, the Lord is with Joseph. And then we see in the book of Exodus, Moses they're telling them about who the Lord is and that the Lord being with them. And then the drama, because the people of Israel, probably a lot like us, were not easy to be around. It's a lot of sin and selfishness. And so there's the tabernacle set up and all the sacrifices and the priests. And yet still the, the people are breaking their promises, are turning away from the Lord. They're pursuing other gods. And this image of people pursuing other gods is... They use words like, like divorce, like you're, you're turning aside, you're having an, an affair with these other so-called beings. Finally gets to the point in Ezekiel where the Lord, the Spirit of God, moves away from the temple and we're left during the return and the exile. Where is God? Has God forgotten His people? Has God forgotten this world? And then we see a child is born. And the angel announces that his name shall be Emmanuel, which is the Hebrew word for God with us. And that's what Jesus is, is God with us. And Jesus came in order that he would be with us. The union with Christ is a centerpiece in our own salvation the understanding of, of how we have the benefits and blessings of God. It, you are forgiven, right? Because you are united with Christ. You have His righteousness. You have His, His innocent blood over you. You have everlasting life because Jesus Christ rose from the dead and lives forever. You are going to dwell with the Father forever because that's where Jesus is. We have the Holy Spirit because that's Jesus had God's Holy Spirit we have this union with the Lord Jesus because we are with Him. 
You guys are familiar with Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not because of works, so that no one may boast. That's how we have this relationship with God. We, we can't earn it. We, we just simply trust the Lord for it. What Paul says, though, a few verses earlier about the nature of this is rather interesting. In Ephesians 2, 5, and 6, we see that we are made alive with Christ. We are raised up with Christ. We are seated in the heavenly places with Christ. We are with, with, with the Lord Jesus Christ. The most common way that the Apostle Paul talks about being a Christian is us being in Christ. We are united with the Lord Jesus. And so as we see that Joseph, the Lord was with him, so too we, if we trust in the Lord Jesus, he is with us as well. And he's with us in this passage and especially when we are going through difficult times. Well, because the Lord Jesus is with us, there are now three things, three things that we are to take away from this. The first is this. Your work matters. Your work matters. This is a word here to all of you students that are struggling to make it to the end of school. Your work matters. Your work matters. This is a word to those that are maybe at a job that they don't quite like. Your work matters. When I was young, my first consistently paid job was to be a dishwasher. I washed dishes. I don't know if you've ever washed dishes before. It's not particularly glamorous. I don't know if it consistently appears on high school counselors' list of future occupations, but this was mine. In fact, I picked this over from across the way, and due to my dishwashing skills, I noticed some spots there, which I did away with with my thumb. Maybe we need to wash it again. What happens if you don't have a dishwasher? Well, this work falls to someone else. Uh, Was it a camp so kids don't get fed? Maybe the meal is spoiled. Or, Or maybe people get sick. You know, your work matters. Your work matters. It matters when you're there with the the little children and no one else sees. It it matters when you're working in a job that you don't like. It it matters if you're kind of waiting for that that next position or or you're faithfully trying to muddle through your studies. It it matters. Here in Joseph, uh, the reason they knew that the Lord was with them was because of his work, the work that he did. I think it's, it's very frustrating when someone boldly pro- proclaims that they are a follower of the Lord Jesus and they don't care about their work. Your work matters. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, uh, Paul tells those that are also in slavery, work heartily for the Lord rather than men. And that's who you're ultimately working for. Not a paycheck, not to get ahead, Not just because you have a boss, but you work ultimately to honor and glorify the Lord. And it matters. And it matters. Secondly, because the Lord is with us, not only does our work matter, but we are to have a Joseph mindset. Have a Joseph mindset. And I just put have a Joseph mindset because what I really wanted to say is don't have a Potiphar's wife mindset. It just seemed like a lot. But that's really what I mean. I I think it's telling that we really sort of identify Joseph having this tremendous moral struggle that 
to restrain himself from lying with Potiphar's wife. And maybe he did. I mean, we just, we just don't know. But I think it is reflective of our own brokenness. I mean, indeed, since the beginning of history, people have been um, doing things sexually that aren't in line with either godly singleness or, you know, one man, one woman and covenant marriage as, the, as we see here in the scriptures. But, but yet, there has been this growing movement over the centuries where truth has been moved from something that we can all objectively agree on to what you feel on the inside. And with that movement of truth to what you feel on the inside, what are the feelings that are most important? Well, it's your own sexual desires. And so the fundamental truth about who you are is how you are sexually. And it's been this focus then on sex. And you combine that with the abundance of illicit material and the accessibility that we can find now through the internet and our mobile devices through the pervasiveness of our own entertainment where there's scarcely a model of, of sexual joy that happens between a husband and a wife or honoring of godly singleness. We see that in, in the way that we talk and treat each other as we uh, distance ourselves and we become more and more utilitarian in, as we approach sexual things. And I think then it's easier for us to more readily identify with Potiphar's wife. It sounds like a Herculean effort to say, well, I'm not going to do this because of the responsibilities entrusted to me, because of the honoring of your marriage, or because I just simply don't want to disobey the Lord. Instead, we are enticed by the idea of an enslaved person secretly having sexual relationships with someone else's wife. And I think if if this story is stirring something inside of you, like, I don't mean to be Captain Obvious, but maybe it's a good time for some self-reflection. Like maybe, maybe ideas about how we approach our sexual lives, they're not coming from this. They're coming from someplace else. And I've let it too deeply to infect my soul. I'm, I'm ready to excuse Joseph if he, if he stumbles here. That is, that's not a big deal because, boy, I know, that sounds really great to me. I think that should be a red flag of our, in our soul to say, This needs attention. So, we need to to have a, a Joseph way of thinking here. Lastly, because God is with us, there is hope for the powerless. There is hope for the powerless. Have you ever felt powerless? Maybe you have a health issue and there just doesn't seem to be any writing it. And you've tried everything, but it's not helped. Maybe you see the bills are stacking up and you don't have two nickels to rub together to address them. And there's nothing there on the horizon. Maybe you're a part of a wealthier family And yet, because of the way the money and the whole thing works, it's this interesting interplay of relationships where, while on the outside, everybody wants to be you. On the inside, all you want is out because you have no real power. You're just being controlled. Maybe you feel powerless because lies have won the day. Have you ever been betrayed by a friend? Someone you thought was close to you. And whether either jealousy or greed, begin sharing lies about you, half-truths, so as to sabotage your relationship, so as to destroy your character. Have you ever been in a family situation where it's like crazy land, 
Reality doesn't exist. You have to navigate this, this world of personalities and all these different kind of half-truths and lies in order just to navigate any sort of family get-together. Maybe you've been through a divorce. You've had someone actively trying to sabotage your relationship. Every little thing that you have ever done is somehow the most evil thing in the world. And it's brought out in public testimony. Have you ever felt powerless? I, I know Joseph has favor with the Lord and permission from Potiphar and even the warden here, but, but functionally he's powerless. He's powerless. And what do we know about Joseph? When, when he was being conspired against by his brothers, the Lord was with him. When he was being thrown into the pit and stripped of his robe, the Lord was with him. When he was being sold into slavery, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. When his outer garment was being torn off of him, the Lord was with him. As the lies were being believed, the Lord was with him. As he served there in incarceration in the king's prison, the Lord was with him. He was with him, and he's with you if you're in Christ. The Lord is with you. When Mercy Hospital says there's nothing we can do, when the University of Iowa is out of ideas, when, when the Mayo Clinic kind of simply shrugs their shoulders, the Lord is with you. When you get the first, the second, and the final notice, the Lord is with you. When, when you're boxed in financially, when, when you're just trying to faithfully love your extended family, when you're trying to forgive your friend, or navigate a co-parenting situation, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. And this is the great truth that gives us hope. God gives hope to the powerless. One of the things that we need to do, ladies and gentlemen, is we need to develop a theology of suffering. I'd like to recommend two books. Uh, one is a little headier than the other, this Tim Keller book, uh, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. Absolutely excellent. This other one is Paul David Tripp's book on suffering. And he talks about an actual example in his life of a kidney issue that he went through, which drug on for years. And I actually remember this. Paul David Tripp was going to come speak at a central district conference. And he had to back out because of a kidney issue. And here it is. It's all here detailed in this book. But I like what he says. Our hope is not found in understanding why God allowed suffering into our lives. Our hope is not found in the belief that somehow we will tough our way through. Our hope is not found in doctors, lawyers, and pastors, and family or friends. Our hope is not found in our resilience and ingenuity. Our hope is not found in ideas or things. And though all, we may look to all of those for temporary help, our hope ultimately rests in the faithful and gracious presence of the Lord with us. You see, He is not weakened by what weakens us. He is not confused by what confuses us. He does not suffer the mood swings that afflict us. He is not afraid like we are. He never makes a bad decision. He never finds himself out of control. He never wants to take back his words. He never regrets the way he's behaved. He never responds impulsively. His choices are never driven by anxiety. He never dreads the next day. He never wants to give up. He is never frustrated by an inability to make a difference. He is with us. But the reason this is so wonderfully comforting is that He is completely unlike us in every way. He is limitless in power. He has authority over everything. He is perfect in every way. He dwells with us. And He assures us that He is not leaving. 
As the worship team comes over, I want you to bow your heads. Maybe God has a word for you today. Maybe it's a word to spur you on <clears throat> into school, a, a job that you don't like, an unending task that seems to be unrelenting, maybe just the burden of watching young children or caretaking for someone that's dependent upon you. Maybe what you need is a word of conviction because a, a, a select slave to secretly having adulterous relationships is like, this is, that sounds glorious. And something is off kilter. But maybe what you need is a word of hope. We're reminded that the end of this story is found in Genesis chapter 50 where indeed Joseph's brothers and probably Potiphar and Potiphar's wife meant it for evil, but we know you, O Lord, meant it for good. And we just need hope in a situation where we feel powerless. We need to know that you, O Lord, the God of the entire universe is there. So just take a moment and let the Lord speak. Father, more than wealth, more than health, more than insight, what we need, O oh Lord, is You. And Lord, we treasure that great truth that not only You are, but You are with us. Lord, I pray that you would do work inside of our soul in order that we might see that reality. Lord, I pray for transformation among the people that are here. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you would continue to use us to be a light to this community and across the globe. We thank you for your faithful work in that. And we ask that you would give us what we need to continue that work until the day you call us home. I ask all these things in the great name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you will. We pray you are blessed and encouraged by this week's message, and we invite you to join us every Sunday, in person or online, for morning worship. Have questions about what it means to know and follow Jesus? Simply email Todd at ankenyfree.church. Thanks for listening.